good morning. Take your hymnal and turn to hymn number 65. Hymn number 65, just over in the glory land. Amen. If you remember the day, you're going to glory land. Amen. Lift it up with me on hymn number 65. I've a home prepared where the saints abide, just over in the glory land. And I long to be by my Savior's side, just over in the glory land. Just over in the glory land, I'll join the happy angel band, just over in the glory land. Throng, I will shout and sing just over in the glory land. Glad hosannas to Christ the Lord and King, just over in the glory land. Just over in the glory land, I'll join the happy angel band, just over in the glory. Number 72, hymn number 72, Is It the Crowning Day? Jesus may come today. should come Ciao. 
that crowning day, that glad day. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, it will be a glad day. He could come anytime, any moment of any day, and we want to be ready. It's wonderful to have each and every one of you here at Blessed Oak Baptist Church. I'm looking around for Jonathan Morris. Is he in here? Could somebody back there locate Jonathan Morris? Yeah, I'm going to need him in a few minutes here. And so uh, that'll help us to expedite matters. And uh, see, as soon as I said Jonathan was coming, Ian left, and I don't know. <laughs> That's not a coincidence. All right. We, we won't even dig any deeper. We'll just let that go, but I think he went to go find him, so it's wonderful to have each and every one of you here. It's always good to see visitors. We'll greet you properly in just a moment. It's just good to see uh, all of our regular folks. I feel like Sunday morning's just uh, family reunion time, you know. And Sunday night, family reunion time. Wednesday night, family reunion time. And so thank you so much uh, for being with us today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, what a joyful uh, Lord time just listening to the choir and then being able to join in and sing your praises. And Lord, we look forward to that glad day. We ask, dear Lord Jesus, in your time, Lord, as it is your will, even so come quickly. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be here today. We ask, Lord, that you would use the preaching of the Bible to help us. We have also, of course, our junior church and primary church services, those that are uh, ministering to our young people. And I pray, Lord, that you'll be in both of those services here also. Lord, thank you, dear God, most of all, for all that you've done for us. Thank you for sending Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And Lord Jesus, thank you for coming, dying on the cross for our sins, paying our terrible sin debt, and then offering to us the gift of eternal life. And uh, Lord, we pray if there's anyone here without Jesus, they'd be saved today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. I have just a few announcements and then... Uh, we will uh, recognize our graduating seniors. But first, I'd like to say hi to our visitors. If you're here today visiting for the first time, Blessed Oak Baptist Church, our ushers have a packet we want to put in your hand, a visitor's packet. On the outside, there's a card. Please fill that out. Drop it in the offering plate, and uh, that way we'll have a record of your visit. If you're here visiting today, if you'll raise your hand good and high, we'll come right to you and give you a visitor's packet. Thank you so much. For being here today. We appreciate so much you coming and being a part of our services today. Just a few things I'll mention from the bulletin. If you didn't get a bulletin, they'll be available after the service in the foyer. Be sure and pick one up. There is, this is Blessed Hope Baptist Church Graduates Recognition Day. 
And we set up a gift table in our foyer for Adria Abel and Jonathan Morris. And so let's be sure and be a blessing to these young people who'll be there this morning and again tonight. And so let's not forget that. And then this Wednesday night we'll have a business meeting. There's a wedding on the horizon. There's a wedding happening this week. And so uh, you'll notice that in the bulletin next Sunday at uh, 515 before our evening service. We're going to have a VBS organization meeting, 515. And so uh, I'll remind you of that again. But uh, I do need you to sign up if you're going to be able to help in Vacation Bible School. There's about three different sign-up lists on the back bulletin. I don't remember what they're all for. Junior camp, yes. Vacation Bible School and... The Navajo trip. So if you have any questions about junior camp, see Brother uh, Roger Young, see Brother Chad Gordon. If you have any questions about the Navajo Indian missions trip, it's time to gear up for all the summer events at Blessed Hope Baptist Church. Looking forward to a great summer. This time I want to have Adria and Jonathan come, and we're wanting to gift them from our church a brand new Schofield Study Bible. It has their name on it. Have you both come over on this side, maybe? And then uh, I want to just congratulate you from our church and have you stay here just a second because we're going to have a special time of prayer for both of you. Amen. Oh, these are two wonderful young men. Well, God's Amen. blessed us here at this church. They uh, have persevered, even endured to the end, shall graduate. <laughs> they endured to the end. They've uh, done a tremendous job, and of course their moms uh, probably ought to get the Bibles and uh, all of the awards that come with it, but uh, both of them did a great job. I always say to this, I said when it comes to homeschooling, there seems like there's no middle ground. People either do an exceptionally great job or they just seem to drop the ball. Right. Well, I will tell you, these two families hey. do an exceptionally great job with this. And we want to go to the Lord in prayer and ask God's blessing upon these two young people as they go forward from this point on. Let's go to the Lord at this time. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift that these two have been to Blessed Hope Baptist Church. It has been a joy, literally, to watch them grow up here. And now, Lord, they're uh, closing a chapter of their life. But how exciting a brand new chapter awaits as they pursue the will of God for their life. And so, Lord, we as a church, we want to just... Uh, Oh, Lord, be uh, to surround them with our prayers. And, and Lord, not to forget to, to stand on their behalf, Lord, and offer supplication before God for their future, for their protection, for their decisions, Lord. Take each of their lives. And, Lord, may it have an amazing, unusual impact for the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord. Thank you for their families. Lord, we want to celebrate this special day with them. So, Lord, bless them. Lord, uh, Jonathan and Adrian. And Lord, may this be a special day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's give a round of applause. Hymn number 167. Hymn 167. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Verse number four, 
Hymn number 18, 1 8. Take the name of Jesus with you. If his name's got power, take it with you. Amen. Take the name of Jesus with you, child.
When I go to sleep each night Though I've had my share of hard times I wouldn't change them if I could Cause through it all God's been good Times replay and I can see I've cried some bitter tears, but I felt his arms around me as I faced my greatest fears. I've had more gains than losses, and I've known more joy than hurt as his grace rolled down upon me. change them if I could cause through it all God's been good God has been my father my savior and my friend his love was my beginning and his love will be my end I could spend forever trying to tell you change them if I could cause through it all God's been good God's been that excellent let's go to first samuel chapter number 17 first samuel chapter number 17 those of you that are somewhat familiar with the placement of um, old testament stories you'll um, know that we're going to talk about david and goliath and it's been a while since i've uh, preached on this subject and for some reason i had uh, uh, two different messages i planned for today and the lord uh, wouldn't let me get away from this. So we're going to preach on the making, the making of a giant killer, the making of a giant killer. This is one of those sermons that I began to prepare, and as I prepared it, it got longer and longer and longer. And then I said, you know, how much abuse do I put the people through? And, uh, and so I decided I'd just whack it off about in the middle, and I'll preach the first half uh, today or this morning, and then tonight if you'll come back. Uh, I'll preach the rest of it tonight, but I'm going to take the first part of the message, which concentrates on this subject, the making of a giant killer. First Samuel chapter 17, I'll just read parts of this story, and you'll get the gist of it. We'll begin in verse number 20. First Samuel 17, verse 20. Let's all stand for the reading of the Bible. First Samuel 17 and verse 20, and David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to, to the fight and shouted for the battle for Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array army against army. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren as he talked with them. Behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. Jump down to verse 26. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? 
Verse 29, and David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? Look at verse number 31. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. And David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of brass upon his head, and also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him, and he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had even in a scrip, and his sling when it was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. Look at verse 48, if you will, verse 48. It came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hastened and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead, that the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth, so David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore, David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this amazing story. And Lord... Thank you most of all for being an amazing God. Lord, we read stories like this in the Bible where someone who should not have won, won. Someone who should not have been able to fight, fought. Someone who should have been a victim becomes a victor. And Lord, it sure helps us. And Lord, as we look at this classic Bible story, I pray that you'll help each and every one of us because everyone in this room from time to time will face a giant. And Lord, the things that we learn from David and the things that we learn about you, they can help us to stand for right during times when maybe it's difficult to do so. So I pray, Lord, that Christians are helped. I pray if there's anyone here without Jesus Christ as their Savior, Lord, that they will be saved today so that they can call you Father and Lord, so that they can spend their life serving you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. <clears throat> The account of the contest between David and Goliath is one of the most well-known stories of the Bible. I first heard this story when I was in elementary school, and I will tell you this, I experienced the same thrill in reading it today as I did as hearing it back then. David's defeat of Goliath is a classic tale of, the, of an under, underdog who stood while others ran, who fought while others cowered, and won when he should have lost. It is the battle between a grizzled soldier and a shepherd boy, a man of war and a teenage delivery boy, a nine and a half foot giant versus a ruddy faced adolescent. As you read the story, you see a youth with a sling and a stone defeat, a warrior champion wearing a 30 pound helmet, 150 pounds of coat of mail, and carrying a spear that weighed over 30 pounds. Seems impossible, and yet it happened. This is not a tale. It is not a story. It is history. 
Here is the summary of 1 Samuel 17. David had three older brothers who were soldiers in King Saul's army. Israel is at war with a nation of Philistine warriors. Because David is not yet 20 years of age, he's at home watching the sheep. By the way, that means he was a teenager, young people. David's father, Jesse, sends David to the battlefield to take the food, to take food and supplies to his brothers and a gift to King Saul. While there, David hears Goliath, the Philistine champion, curse Jehovah God and challenge any soldier of Israel to a one-on-one -on -one, one -on battle, winner take all. David is offended at Goliath's blasphemy and shocked to see that no one accepts his challenge. And because he voices this, he's chided by his brothers and told to go home and take care of the sheep. But the word of David's words is brought to King Saul, and soon David is delivered there, and he volunteers to fight, king, uh, fight Goliath. The king tells him that he would have no chance against the giant, but David insists that God has helped me in the past. This is what he told him. He's helped me in the past. He told him the story of, of a lion and a bear and how they had attacked the sheep and how he, with God's help, had defeated both of them. And if God can help him then, why couldn't God help him now? Saul offers David his own armor, but David refuses it because he had not proved it. So he descends, think about this, into the valley of Elah wearing his shepherd's garb and carrying nothing but his sling. There is a brook at the bottom of the valley. Can you picture David as he descends down into the valley? And he stops and kneels at the brook. And, and there David stoops down and selects five smooth stones. We'll talk more about those five smooth stones tonight. And the Bible says he places all of them in his shepherd's bag. As David ascends the hill towards Goliath, the giant begins to mock him and curse him and tell David that he's going to slaughter him. And after he slaughters him, he's going to hack him in little pieces and feed him, hand feed him to the birds of the air and the beast of the field. But David takes courage. He looks at the Goliath, Goliath and announces that he will uh, fight the giant, not to bring glory to the name of David, but to bring glory to the name of the Lord. He tells Goliath that God will deliver him into his hand that day. And then David does something shocking. He runs towards the giant. And as he does so, he reaches into his bag and he selects, picks one of the stones and puts it in his sling. And then the Bible says, David, slang it. I don't know why, but I just like saying that. He slang it. The stone hits Goliath in the forehead with such speed and force that it stuns him and he falls face first to the ground. David does not have a sword of his own to finish off the giant, so he runs to the giant and pulls his own sword out of its scabbard, and he decapitates it, uses Goliath's own sword to decapitate his opponent. Now, when I was a junior high boy, I really liked that part. And the Philistine army sees their champion defeated, turns tail and runs. The army of Israel pursues and slaughters the Philistine army, and God gives them a great victory that day, and I love the story of David and Goliath. The story has lessons for each of us today, because you see, folks, it's not just a story for Sunday school, and it's not just a story for children. Every Christian must learn to be a giant killer, because every Christian, sooner or later, is going to have to face his or her giants. And there is a valley of Elah waiting for you, and it's waiting for me. If you're going to win in that day, you're going to need to learn some lessons from David. So let's let David teach us. This morning I'm going to preach on the making, the making of a giant killer. I think that there's three main ingredients that was in David. He wasn't born with them, but he developed them in his growing up years. And young people, I want you to take note of this. David, and I studied this and researched it, and there's not a consensus opinion, but most people believe that David was somewhere between 16 and 19 years of age when this happened. He was a teenager. And you know what? As a teenager, you're going to have to face some giants. As a teenager, you're going to have to sometimes take a stand and take it by yourself. And if you're going to do it in that day, it's going to be because you have three things inside of you that was inside of David. And I want to look at each of those this morning, number one, David had conviction. 
He had conviction. We see that in verse number 26 of this chapter. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach, uh, the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? There's some things that David had decided in his youth, in his youth, that he just could not let go. He could not stand by and listen to and not do something about. And one of those things was he was not going to listen to God be blasphemed and not do something about it. And by the way, it'd be good for every single one of us in this room to decide our days of staying mute mouth and silent while people are blaspheming God, those days are over. And you know what? If they're bold enough to blaspheme God, we need to be bold enough to defend God and speak up for God and stand for God. And David had something called a conviction about that. I'm not going to tolerate it. I'm not going to put up with it. You're not going to use my Savior's name in vain without being challenged. You're not going to say, oh my God, without me talking to you about the God you just blasphemed. You know what? I'm going to have some convictions and some beliefs, and I'm going to stand up and face down some things. I'm, got, I'm just not going to let some things go. And David had something called a conviction. You know what? There's another word for it. We find it in verse 29. David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? You see, folks, a conviction will give you a cause. If you have no convictions, you'll have no causes. If you have not one conviction, you won't even have one cause. But because he had conviction, he had a cause. And you know what? David didn't ask for this situation, but it was thrust upon him. And just because everybody else was immobile, he could not stand there and not speak up for the Lord and not challenge what was going on. You see, Dave, David believed that a man ought to do what is right. Young people, are you listening to me? David believed that a man ought to do what is right. That doing right was a cause unto itself. When David was assigned by his father the job of caring for the sheep, some people might see that as a, a uh, minor task, uh, a, a, a job for an adolescent to keep him busy, but David, when he was assigned that, to him it was a cause. It was a cause. He took the responsibility seriously. When David was assigned by his father the job of caring for the sheep, he did not see it as a chore. He saw it as a cause. So when the lion came and then a bear, both determined to steal a lamb from the flock, you know what? David acted out of his conviction. You see, he was the shepherd. It was his assignment. It was his job to protect the sheep. Here's something threatening the sheep. You know what? This is not a job to me or a chore to me. This is a cause. I've been entrusted with these sheep. My father entrusted me with these sheep. And because what he had been entrusted with was now threatened, he stood up that day. You see, he stood up for a cause because he acted out of his conviction. He was the shepherd. It was his responsibility. So you know what he did that day? He fought a lion. And then he fought a bear. And by the way, they came at the same time according to the story. He had to whip one and turn around and whip the other one. But by God's grace, he defeated both, thus saving the sheep. Why did he do it? Because he had a conviction, a conviction. Now, young people, do you want to be a giant killer? Then take seriously the jobs assigned to you in your youth. Will you stand for the, for the Lord in the big moments of life? Preacher, will I stand in the big moments? Well, let me ask you this. Are you standing in the little moments? Because if you won't stand in the little moments, then you won't stand in the big moments. Preacher, will I stand while everyone's watching? I can answer that question. You know what? You can, but you won't if you won't stand when nobody's watching. You see, folks, God is going to bring into every single one of your lives a time, a valley of Elah, a moment where, you know what, you're either going to stand for what you say you believe or you're going to fold like a lawn chair but you're going to have to make a decision. There's a young preacher by the name of Abdel Judah. He is the youth pastor of the First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana. I listened again to his remarkable testimony recently. Many of our young people here have heard 
Brother Jude to preach and share his testimony. He was saved as a teenager. By the way, bus workers, keep going out there and knocking on doors. Keep inviting them. There's some giant killers out there somewhere, future giant killers. But he came to church and he got saved and he began to stand for God and serve God. And he began to make bold stands in his public school. And he began to witness to his friends and he began to carry his Bible to school. But there was a teacher, an atheistic, humanistic teacher that noticed what he was doing and he sought an occasion against him. So one day, while Brother Judah was in class, the teacher asked the young people in that classroom, how many of you here believe in the existence of God? And as a few people raised their hand, Brother Judah being one of them, he began to laugh. And then he went and spent the next several minutes with a chalk on the board and a lecture, and, and he set out to to prove to all of these young people that God was a fairy tale and that he did not exist. And he spent several, a good amount of time going through this process. And then when he got done, he turned around and looked back at the class and he said, now, after hearing what I just said, who still believes that God exists? And all of the other ones in the class, they lost heart and lost faith but Brother Judah raised his hand one more time and the teacher laughed, shook his head and dismissed the class. When he came into class the next day, the teacher had taken all of the desks in the classroom and, on, and he had placed all of them on one side of the classroom. All of the desks on one side of the classroom except for one desk on the empty side of the classroom. And as the students came in, he said, all of you that yesterday said that you did not believe in God, I want you to sit on the right side of the classroom. And the one who said that he believed in God, I want you to sit on the left side of the classroom. Now folks, listen to me. This isn't a story or a made up illustration. This is something that a young man had to face during his teenage years in a high school. And you know what? He walked over to that single desk and he sat down. And the, uh, the teacher then began to go on another tirade against God and gave him another chance to move his desk over to join the other ones. Do you still believe in God? And he raised his hand that he still believed in God. Now folks, we thank God for that kind of boldness, but I want you for a minute to put yourself in his shoes. You've got to walk into class the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and everyone's sitting on one side of the classroom saying they didn't believe in God, and you're being singled out on the other side of the classroom, separated from the group because of your belief in God. And he was very transparent when he shared his testimony. He said, I'm going to tell you something. Even though I stood for several days, it was wearing me down. And I kept saying to God, you know, Lord, this is so unfair, and, and I don't think it's worth it, and good night. I, I just want this over, and I'm tired of being humiliated, and I'm tired of being laughed at, and I'm tired of being thought to be ignorant, and he said that, that he finally came home after one of those days of humiliation and walked into his room that, and then he had his Bible with him that he'd carried to school and he said, I'm ashamed to say it, but I literally took the Bible and threw it against the wall and I said to myself, I'm not doing that anymore. But then a thing happened right after that. His mother came upstairs and said, there's a young man here to see you. He went downstairs and there was a young man that also was in that classroom. By the way, of all of the young men in that classroom, this was the young man with the worst reputation. This was the one that was, would have been identified as the biggest heathen, the biggest sinner. He was the one that was on dope. He was the one that uh, scoffed and mocked at God. He was the one that was in all kinds of trouble. He was the one that was a member of a gang, a local gang. And this man was at the bed. This young man was waiting at the bottom of the stairs. And he said, Judah, can I talk to you? And he said, yes. And he went outside and sat on the front porch with him and he said, I can't get what you're doing out of my head. I can't sleep at nights. He said, the guys in the gang, they say they have courage. They don't have that kind of courage. They say they really believe what they say they believe. He said, I don't believe what I believe like you believe what you believe. What have you got that, that I don't have? And you know what? Judah was able to go back up. Brother Judah was able to go back up and pick up that Bible off the floor and take it down and lead his friend to the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, folks, 
When he walked back into the classroom the next day, the chairs were all set up the way they were before, and Judah sat down by himself, but that, that ex-gangbanger, come on, walked in, picked his desk up, and walked over and set his desk beside Abdel Judah's desk that day, and when the teacher asked this time who still believes in God, there were two hands that went up. And by the way, those two began to witness to the other ones and slowly more class members got saved and more of the desks began to move over from one side of the classroom to the other. Listen to me. Where is that kind of conviction in young people today? Those of you that attend the public school, I'm glad you come to church on Sunday. But you know what? Why don't you bring your Bible to church on or to school on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday? Listen, do you act the Christian here? But then to give in and act like a pagan away from here? Where is the giant killers? Where are the giant killers? Where are the ones that really believe what they say they believe? Not here, but down in their heart. Where are the convictions? So if you want to be a giant killer, first of all, have convictions. Stand for a cause. Giant killers are men and women and young men and young women, boys and girls who live by convictions and understand that there is a cause. So the first ingredient we see in David is conviction. Number two, we see courage. We see courage. You've got your Bibles open to 1 Samuel 17. Look at verse 31 and 32. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Now, folks, listen to me. Again, we just read this as a story, but could you put yourself in his place? He had listened to Goliath. He had watched this mighty champion. He had seen the size of this warrior. And yet he is a teenage boy, walks in and looks into the eyes of a king and says, don't despair. I will go fight this this a giant. Now, listen, that takes courage. I want to say it again, it takes courage. It's easy to talk about what you would do if you were in this circumstances. David wasn't just talking about it. David was making a decision to do something about it. When Moses came to the end of his life, and he was handing the leadership of a nation to a young man named Joshua, he exhorted him with these words. Let me read them to you out of Joshua chapter 1. Be strong and of a good courage for unto this person unto this people wilt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do all do according to all, all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee turn not from it to the right hand or to the left that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then shalt thou make thy way prosperous, and then shalt thou have good success. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest." See, folks, Moses knew this. Having led the children of Israel for 40 years, Moses knew one thing. You know what he needed? Uh, knew? He knew that this new leader was going to need courage. You see, Mo Moses knew that Joshua must lead the people into Canaan land. The walls of Jericho waited beyond the Jordan River. 31 heathen kings leading 31 pagan armies waited, determined to to, to, to defeat the children of God, Moses said three times, Joshua, you are going to need courage. Joshua chapter 1, be strong and of a good courage. And again, only be thou strong and very courageous. And then again in verse 9, have not I commanded thee be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. I want to say to all of the future giant killers in this room, you young people, watch this. There are going to be times when you must stand alone, you must fight alone, and you must face down wrong all by yourself. In that day, here's my admonition to you, be strong and of a good courage. 
be strong and very courageous. Be not afraid to be dismayed. The Lord stands up for the one who will stand up for him. I want to talk to you about another teenager that I seen and I met and I admire. And by the way, we're still in contact with her today. I'll give you just her first name. Her name was Maria. She was a a 17-year-old girl that lived on one of our bus routes in inner city Chicago. And she came to church. I wish I could tell you the miraculous way in which the Lord directed us to her. But God's hand was very much in us finding this young lady and finding this family. Her and her sister came to church while her brothers laughed and mocked at them for going. Her and her sister came to church while her mom cursed our church. Her and her, her, and her sister came to church while her father many times forbade them to come to church. But when he would say yes, they would come on the bus route. She was more faithful than her younger sister, and to be honest with you, that wore down her younger sister. There came a time when she would no longer ride the bus, but you know what? Despite all the ridicule and despite the parents being anti-church and anti-God and anti-salvation and anti-Bible, when she could get them to agree, she would come to church. And you know what? She was faithful. And, and, And I want to say this. She began to come to church and then she got saved. But after she got saved, when she would come to church, you know what? She began to change. And I, I want to just, everybody look up to me and listen to me for just a minute. Let me tell you, if God truly saves you, he didn't save you so that you could stay the way you are. Who God truly saves, he changes. That's why the Bible says that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And so the more that she went to church, the more she learned about the changes she needed to make in her life. And you know what? The more she was willing to make those changes. And again, the more you change, and the more you become more like Jesus and less like the world, what do you think happened in that home? The more ridicule she received, the more taunting, the more cursing, the more of a hard time she was given every single week of her life. I've told this story a few times from the pulpit here. I'll tell it one more time. She uh, finally was standing for the Lord so firm, so strong. I was so proud of her. 17 years old, going on 18 years of age. And you know what? She stood as an example and as a witness to her family and her friends and her church. And uh, you know what? There came a day when she wanted to go to church. And you know, she always had to go. Started Friday evening. Every Friday evening, she started working on mom and dad and trying to get them to say yes before Sunday morning. And so she stayed up to talk to her dad Friday night about going to church. The only problem is he was out and it was late and he was down at the tavern. And when he came in, he was drunk. And when he got drunk, he was a mean drunk. And uh, she met him at the door and he came in and he said, Dad, I want to talk to you about going to church. And she, he looked at her and said, I hate that church. I hate that church and I hate your God. And he said, you're going to say it. What am I going to say, Dad? That you hate your church and you hate your God. And he said, she said, uh, Daddy, I don't hate my church and I don't hate God. She's, he said, you're going to say it. You're going to say it. You're going to say that you hate that church and you hate your God. By the way, young people, I'm talking about a teenage girl. I'm talking about a valley of Elah. I'm talking about facing down Goliath. You know what? Her, her family was against it. But you know what? If God is for you, who can be against you? And she said, Daddy, I'll, I'll do whatever you want me to do. If you want me to do chores... I'll do them. I want to obey you. I want to be obedient. But I cannot say that I hate my church and I hate my God because I do not. I cannot say that. And that man, remember, folks, he was drunk and he was a mean drunk. And he curled up his fist like this and he hit this young lady right in the face and dropped her right to the ground. He waited for a minute, kicked her a few times, told her to get up. She stood up in front of him and he said, now you're going to say it. Are you listening to me? Say, young people, you may never face something this drastic in your life, but sometime, somewhere, you're going to have to stand against the Goliath. You're going to have to stand for God. And if you don't have any conviction, you won't stand. And if you don't have courage, you won't stand. And she had tears running down her face, and she said, Daddy, I love you. 
and I want to see you get saved. But you know, I can't say that. And he hit her again and he kicked her and said, get up. And the, the next day, Saturday morning, I get, head to Chicago. And that's one of the first houses I visit. And I knocked on the door and knocked on the door and didn't think anybody was home. Finally, the door opened about this much. And all I could see was this young lady. She had her head turned sideways and she had the long, long black hair that almost went down to the bottom of her, uh, to the back of her knees. And she turned her head in such a way so her hair would cover her face. And I said, Maria, you gonna be able to come tomorrow? She said, I don't think so. And she started to shut the door. I said, Maria, what's going on? And she said, Brother Jerry, would you just go? I'll talk to you next week. And I said, no, I won't go. Something's wrong. I said, you need to look at me. And she said, I, I can't look at you. I said, you need to look at me. And finally she pulled her hair back like this for just a second and let it fall back. And listen, you know, if you're a, a red blooded male, Come on, if there's any manhood in you at all, you know what you want to do at that point? And she began to say to me, Brother Jerry, please go. I knew you'd be mad. My dad's not a bad person. He's just really bad when he gets drunk. And he was drunk last night and he didn't mean to. She begged me to leave. And I walked away from that door and said, I'll be here next week. And uh, I got about halfway down the, the block from where our house is. And here it is 10 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday and the streets are busy and there's people everywhere. And, and I walked as far as I could walk and I got down on my knees and on my face on, in the middle of the sidewalk. And I said, God, God, could I stand like that? God help her, bless her conviction and bless her courage. You know what the next Sunday, they let her ride the bus and the next Sunday, she rode the bus. And you know what happened on her 18th birthday? Me and my wife pulled up in front of her house and we told her, have your bags packed. And we put her bags in our car and we moved her out of that house. And we put her on a plane and flew her down to Texas where one of my lady bus workers was spending the summer. And that's where she lived. And she lived with Miss Joy Garlic for the summer. And then she flew back to Hammond, Indiana to Chicago the next fall and she enrolled in Hiles Anderson Bible, uh, Bible College. Uh, let me just look, up, look out here and, and just ask you, where are the giant killers? Where are the giant killers? Uh, you'll meet her, I think, sometime soon. She's been texting Cheryl back and forth and said, me and a couple of your other old bus kids want to drive down and spend a weekend with you. And so we're trying to figure out a date that's going to work for all of this and have an invasion of Chicago bus kids. <laughs> By the way, get that out of your mind. They're all old now, okay? They're all old. But there's that little girl. There's that little girl. By the way, where is she this morning? She's in church this morning. Okay? What, what did she carry into church this morning? She carried this into church this morning. What am I talking about? I'm talking about being a giant killer. It's time we stop talking about how much we believe in God, and it's time we start acting like we believed in God. It's time for God to let, start letting uh, you know, the Bible change you as a young person because you know what? God needs young giant killers. God needs young giant killers. God needs young giant killers. But you know what? It's going to take conviction. And you know what else it's going to take? It's going to take courage. And the last one is this. It's going to take confidence in the Lord. Confidence in the Lord. If you got your Bible open, look at verse 43. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. Watch this. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day into the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Listen to me, folks. If it's the right thing to do, you can do it. 
You know why you can do it? Because God will help you do it. You can't do it in your own power, but your, your confidence and faith is in God. You can defeat your Goliath. You know, that's why the Bible tells us to take on the whole armor of God. Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You say, well, Pastor David refused to wear armor that day when he defeated Goliath. No, that's not true. He refused to wear Saul's armor that day. But I believe that day when he walked into that valley, he was wearing the armor of the Lord. When he descended into the valley, he was wearing the helmet of salvation. When he stooped to pick up those stones from the brook, his loins were girded about with truth. When he began walking up towards Goliath, he was wearing the breastplate of righteousness. As he ran towards the giant that cursed him, his feet was shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Nobody could see it, but it was there. When he reached in that bag for a stone, he was taking up the shield of faith. When David slang, slang that stone, there was a helmet of salvation on his head and the sword of the Spirit by his side. Listen, don't underestimate a young Christian with convictions. Don't underestimate a young Christian with courage. Don't underestimate a young Christian with a cause. They may seem to you to be ill-equipped, but Christians who wear the armor of God, there's not a pagan out there that can stand against it. Young people, listen to me and I'm done. Say your prayers and make your stand. Say your prayers and make your stand. If it's still right to do, then it's right to do it. Okay, if it's still right to, to stand, then it's right to stand for it. If it's still right to fight the good fight of the faith, then, then fight the good fight of the faith. You see, the devil is mocking the saints of God, and I'm afraid too many of them are like most of the army of Israel. They're hunkering down and hiding and cowering. You know what we need? We need some giant killers. I'm going to say it again. We need giant killers. We need some giant killers. We need some young men, young women who will receive Christ as their Savior. If you're here today, you're never going to have this kind of conviction and this kind of courage. Come on. And this kind of, kind of confidence until you have Jesus Christ as your Savior. When you get that in your heart, then you know what? You can access all these other things. So you know what? We need some young people that if you're not saved, it's time to get saved. Time to get born again. Time to receive Christ as your Savior. And then you know what? Once you are saved, why don't you pick up your King James Holy Bible? Come on, put your faith and trust in the Lord and the power of his might, and stand there and say, I will fight for what is right. And when others won't fight, you turn around and look at them and ask them a question, is there not a cause? It doesn't matter whether 20 go with you or 200 go with you, or you have to go by yourself. If you have, watch this, convictions, and you have courage, and you have confidence, not in yourself, but in the Lord, you know what? You can walk into that valley of Elah, and you can face down your Goliath, and you can feel what David felt when he won that victory. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, that you'd rise up some giant killers. Lord, raise them up. Raise them up. Seems like the Goliaths, are, they're, they're uh, raising up. They're taking their stands. They're having their say. And Lord, we need an entire generation of young men and young women It'll say, Grandma and Grandpa don't have to stand by themselves. I'll stand with them. I, I've, got, I've got some convictions, and they come from the Word of God. I've got some courage, and it comes from the Lord. And I've got some confidence because my confidence is in God. Lord, I pray, dear Lord, that you would help our young people to stand. Help them to stand, Lord. Bless our seniors that are just graduating. Help them to stand for you. Pray for some of the younger ones that are coming on up, Lord. I pray, dear Lord, that they would develop some convictions, some courage, some confidence. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Lord, we need some giant killers. We need some giant killers. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, if you're here today and you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can enlist in the army of God this morning. You have to realize that you're a sinner. Understand that because of your sin, you don't deserve to go to heaven. None of us do. But you know what? Jesus Christ died on the cross. When he did so, he did that to pay for your sins. But you know what? He didn't stay dead. Three days later, he rose again. 
You know what? He is willing to save you today. He's willing to offer to you the gift of eternal life, forgive you of your sins. He's willing to adopt you into his family, but as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. Wow. If you've never received Christ as your savior, I would pray that you'd be saved today. If you have been saved, you know what? We need giant killers. We need young people with conviction. We need young people with courage. Come on now, we need young people with confidence in the Lord. Just a minute, we're gonna stand to our feet. Not yet, in just a minute. If you're here without Jesus Christ as your Savior, say, preacher, I don't know for sure if I died right now, I'd go to heaven. I don't know that for sure. But I'd like somebody to talk to me about it. God is stirring my heart right now. I'm concerned about it. I want to know, I, I want to be able to know for sure that I'm on my way to heaven. In just a minute, as we begin to let the piano player play, once we stand and pray, I would ask that you'd step from your pew, come to the nearest aisle, come down here. Brother Brian Morris is waiting here. and He'll get somebody. If you're a lady, he'll get a lady to take the Bible. We have people trained to be able to use the Bible and show you how you can know for sure that you're on your way to heaven. Listen, if God is speaking to your heart, and you're not sure you're, you're saved, would you be saved today? Heavenly Father, please, Lord, speak to each and every heart here. May that one that needs you the most, that's closest to death, Lord, may they receive Christ today. Lord, I pray, dear God, for Christians who are, Lord, are living with the foot half in and one foot in the world, one foot in the church, and half in, half out. And Lord, they're inconsistent. And Lord, the world is, is way too important to them. I pray, God, that they'd find their way to an altar, and back to your book, and back to a life of blessing pray these things in Jesus name. Let's all stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. The piano player's playing. If you're here without Christ, would you step out of your pew and come right now, walk right to the front, say, excuse me to the person next to you. Come right up here and meet with brother Brian.